Hello students, uh, I'm Dr. P. Suresh, Associate Professor, Radio Diagnosis. Uh, today I'll be discussing computer topography and magnetic resonance imaging basics. Coming to computer tomography, a brief history about CT. It was a uh, Godfrey Hounsfield from England in 1972 who first discovered CT. So CT is also called as CAT which is computerized axial transverse scanning. The first commercial scanner was launched in 1973 for which the Nobel Prize uh, was shared by Hounsfield from UK and Alan M. Cormack from USA in the year 1979. The first test images in CT were performed in 1967. The clinical images were performed in 1971. And the first commercial scanner came into use in 1972. So here you can see the images from the old scanners. And on the right hand side you can see one such old CT scanner. Now what is the basic principle of CT? The basic principle of CT is the math it uses a mathematic principle which was developed by Radon in 1917. With plain film imaging, the 3D anatomy of the patient is reduced to a 2D projection image. With the conventional radiograph of the patient's anatomy, information with respect to the dimension parallel to the X-ray beam is lost. A series of 360 radiographs required at one angle angular intervals around the patient. Impossible for a human eye to visualize cross-sectional images. The tomographic image is a picture of a slab of the patient's anatomy. What are the indications for the CT scan? The most common indications for a CT scan are acute neurological deficit like a cerebrovascular accident, intracranial bleed, for imaging the paranasal sinuses, the temporal bone, in the lung it is used for imaging interstitial lung disease, bronchogenic carcinoma, mediastinal lymphadenopathy and lung masses. Trauma is another important indication, be it blunt trauma or penetrating trauma. Acute abdomen in cases of appendicitis, intestinal obstruction, perforation and renal colic. Other uses in the gastrointestinal tract for compound fractures and angiographies like cerebral, coronary, extremities, renal and aortic arteriogram. That is, all these can be, angiographies can be very well delineate, delineated by CT. As indications, there are some uh, contraindications of CT, of which the absolute ones are pregnant patients. CT is absolutely contraindicated in pregnant patients, and some of the relative contraindications are in children and in the uh, reprodu reproductive females. Whenever CT is used, we use uh, two types of imaging. One is a plain CT, another is the contrast CT, where we give intravenous contrast. So some people will have allergy to intravenous contrast media, some people with renal failure cannot tolerate contrast media, patients on metformin, toxic nodule of thyroid because there will be adverse reactions in these patients and if there is any planned radioiodine treatment of thyroid cancer and extremes of age less than 2 years and greater than 60 years. So these are some of the contraindications absolute and relative for usage of CT. Now coming to the Hounsfield units, just to know, the, the basic ones are as follows. Water has a Hounsfield unit of 0, air minus 1000, fat minus 20 to minus 200, fluid 0 to 15, soft tissue 20 to 60 Hounsfield units, calcification 150 to 200 Hounsfield units and bone 
has plus 1000 Hounsfield units. So you can see the windowing here in this diagram. The grayscale image is represented from more dark on the bottom to less dark on the top. You have the window width and the window level. Like certain tissues acquire certain will have certain colors on CT, soft tissue, fat, bone, etc. as we have seen here. So similarly, we have to select the window width and window level while viewing a CT image so that these structures can be delineated more crisply. So these are some of the images as you all can see. Uh, we, this, the left hand side is a cardiac CT, a 3D reformated volume rendered image. So here we have a 3D CT image of the pelvis where you can see clearly the uh, entire pelvis with the hip joints, with the sacroiliac joints and the hip bones. So this is a CT angiography, cerebral angiography. So what you can visualize here is the circle of Willis and the major intracranial arteries. So this is a traditional CT of the abdomen. So here you can see the liver. the spleen, the stomach, this is a CT fluoroscopy. CT can be also used for interventions like through CT we can do a biopsy or a aspiration if any pathology is there. For example, if there is a nodule in the liver, if you have to characterize a nodule as benign and malignant, it would be very difficult uh, by just putting a needle blindly without the help of imaging. Ultrasound might help, we can do it with ultrasound guidance, but if the conditions don't permit for an ultrasound guidance, we can do a CT guided biopsy of the lesion. There's one more technique in CT called CT endoscopy, where, wherein you can visualize, uh, for example, in this case, the bronchus. So this is called as a CT bronchoscopy. It's also called as a virtual bronchoscopy because it's not a real-time bronchoscopy. We can visualize these structures on CT by performing a CT and then doing a reformation and reconstruction so it is not a real-time image so that is why it is called as a virtual bronchoscopic image however it adds a good amount of detail when compared to the real bronchoscopy as well now what are the other applications of ct so ct is used for virtual autopsy sometimes um, to know the cause of death, apart from the real post-mortem examination, CT can sometimes use to delineate the cause of death, which is called as virtual autopsy. Also used to detect the timber quality and meat quality. CT is also used at airports to check the luggage materials. CT is also used to re reconstruct the evolution from the fossils and old mummies. These are some other uses of CT. Now, what are the advantages of CT? CT is a multi-section imaging technique. It's useful in trauma, acute head injury. It helps to detect fractures, masses, which are easily missed on X-ray sometimes. Low cost when it is compared to MR. It has less number of protocols, lesser image acquisition time, and it's useful in claustrophobiacs. Uh, unlike to MR, it's useful in patients who have stents, implants, we can do a MPR, which is nothing but a multiplanar reformation. It's excellent for bone and calcium uh, details and also lung pathology. Now, certain disadvantages of CTR. It has ionizing radiation, so which is harmful. It's a it can cause a biological hazard. Normal control volunteers cannot be exposed unnecessarily because it is radiation. So we cannot have, have some control subjects and uh, other subjects to compare with them. It has poor soft tissue contrast. It is best for bone, calcium, etc. But poor soft tissue contrast like cartilage, ligaments and muscles which are better visualized on MRI. It's contraindicated in renal failure and uh, intravenous contrast is also contraindicated in patient's allergy. And most important is we cannot use this in pregnant patients. Now that finishes off with CT.
So just to highlight on MRI, so basics of MRI, MRI is nothing but magnetic resonance imaging. So the principle of MRI is nuclear magnetic resonance. Now what's the history of MRI? In the 1930, Felix Bloch from Stanford University and Edward Purcell from Harvard University discovered nuclear magnetic resonance, which is NMR. For their discovery of nuclear magnetic resonance, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1952. So, these were the two scientists, Felix Bloch and Edward Purcell. Now, coming to the history of MRI, in 1970s, Raymond the Median proposed that each tissue in the body has a different relaxation time. But, I will not be going with the physics of MRI. It has a lot of physics, like you have relaxations and all that, proton spins. I will not be going into the detail of all. Just for you all as ninth termers, what is the basic principle of MRI I will be delineating? So the abnormal tissue has an abnormal long relaxation time. So he believed that the NMR could be used as an external probe for the internal ejection of cancer. So these two scientists, Paul C. Lutterbur, determined the origin of radio waves by analysis of their characteristics. Peter Mansfield further developed the utilization of gradients in the magnetic field. MRI is one of the most remarkable diagnostic technologies available today. The images we obtain, obtain today are far superior to all other methods of imaging. The equipment, uh, or sometimes you know, the CT and MR equipment are somewhat similar, but they work on totally different principles. Now, what is a magnetic field? Because MRI, every MRI scanner has a huge magnet, so the the concept of of the magnetic field is very important. A field is a region in space such that if certain objects are placed within this region they will experience a force. A field can be considered as a sort of potential force. A magnetic field is induced if and only if there is a moving or electrical charge. The unit of the field, as you all know and have studied, is Tesla or Gauss. So, this is a general overview. So, the patient is placed in the magnetic field the gradient fields are then got and then the RF signal that is the radio frequency signal is detected and the image is there for reconstruction. So place the subject in a magnetic field, transmit radio waves into a subject, turn off radio wave transmitter, receive radio waves retransmitted by subject and convert measured radio frequency data into the image. So what are the indications for the MRI scan? Among all these indications, I would say MRI is safe in pregnant patients. So patients, pregnant females who are not candidates for CT scan or X-rays, MRI uses non-ionizing radiation. It will not harm the fetus nor the mother. So they can safely undergo an MRI scan. Apart from them, chronic headache, tumors, hyperacute stroke, we use the diffusion weighted imaging, whereas wherein we can diagnose stroke as early as ours in MRI, white matter lesions, neck masses, brachial plexus injuries, musculoskeletal structures like ligaments, cartilage, cartilages, tumors and arthritis of course, and the spine, disc herniations, spinal cord lesions, vertebral bodies, the gastrointestinal tract, we can use MRI for infective inflammatory pathologies as well as tumors, in the heart, it's it is used to diagnose myocardial infarction, tumors of the heart, and some cardiomyopathies. In hepatobiliary system, it's used in infective and neon plastic lesions, and in MRCP, which is magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography. It's used in angiographies as well, as well like CT, cerebral angiography, renal and extremities, pregnant ladies with appendix and other acute comorbidities, children with neurological deficits, 
those who are allergic to intravenous iodinated contrast and in renal failure patients, MRI can be used. Now, what are the contraindications of MRI? So, the most important uh, contraindication is like pregnancy is the most common indication and it is the most common contraindication of CT. But in MRI, the most important contraindications are claustrophobia. See, MRI, uh, the patient is made to lie down in a closed and it's a closed, it's a Faraday case. The entire MRI room is a Faraday case. Some people will find it very difficult. They'll, they'll uh, you know, they would have claustrophobia. So in such patients, it's not advisable to carry on the scan and we have to terminate the scan. Then if there are any metallic foreign body in, in the eye or anywhere else, cardiac pacemakers, coronary stents, any aneurysmal clips, ferromagnetic metallic implants and cochlear implants, these are all contraindications for MRI. What are the advantages of MRI? MRI has high intrinsic contrast. The direct transfer, sagittal and coronal imaging can be done. Multi-section imaging can be done. See, in CT, I just want to tell you all that here at this point. In CT, we cannot do a direct scan like a transfer, sagittal and coronal scan. We can just do an axial scan and then we can get a reformatted image of the axial scan by doing reformations. But in MRI, we can directly do an axial scan a trans that is a transverse sagittal and coronal scan. So there is no bone or an air artifact MRI, no ionizing radiation, there are no known biological hazards, normal control volunteers can be imaged and possibility for tissue characterization and blood flow imaging. What are the, what are the disadvantages? It takes a long time to uh, to do an MRI when compared to CT. So, long imaging time is one disadvantage. There are many protocol options. There are ample number of protocols and everyone has to get acquainted with these protocols. The correct choice of the machine parameters is essential before we start an MRI. See, bone and calcium cannot be delineated well on MRI unlike CT. So, that is another disadvantage. CT is very good for bone and calcium. Whereas MRI is very good for soft tissue structures. And there's reduced facial resolution, especially with body coil. So body, the see coil is a, it's 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 a structure for wherein the, it's a part used for a patient with a particular organ to be imaged. So in the body coil, the facial resolution is less. Claustrophobia occurs in two to five percent of cases studied. There's difficulty to manage and monitor patients who are critically ill. And patients who are not cooperative cannot be undergoing MRI. There's a remote query of a long-term hazard. And of course, it's high cost. So just to highlight on the parameters of CT and MRI for comparing, the scientist who developed CT were, I mean, sorry, was Godfrey Hounsfield and MRI, Raymond and Medion, NMR, it was Purcell. So these three, Raymond, Demedian and Purcell and Gauri Hounsfield for CT. The principles were developed by Alan Cormack and Johan Redon for CT and Paul Etterbur and Peter Mansfield for MRI. So the principle CT works on the principles of a principle of X-rays, whereas MRI works on the principles of gyromagnetic property. Radiation is absent in MRI and it is very much there in CT. For bone and lung imaging, CT is indicated, whereas MRI does not give a much good detail of bone and lung. Acute conditions, CT is preferred. MRI, yes, with limited protocols. Soft tissue contrast is very high in MRI and less in CT. The description, the parameters for description in CT are density and MRI intensity. So, areas which are more bright are called hyper intense in MRI and areas which are less bright are called hypo intense. Similarly, hypo and hyper are used with density. Hypo density is a dark region, hyper density is a bright region. So claustrophobia, metallic implants, cochlear implants are contraindications for MRI, whereas CT, it's not CT is quick and metallic implants, of course they will give some artifacts, but they are not contraindicated. For cartilage imaging, CT cannot be done, MRI is the best. Pregnant patients, 
CT cannot be done. We have to go ahead with the MRI. Teratogenicity, CT of course. There is risk to the developing fetus if CT is done during the period of embryogenesis. That's why in pregnancy, CT is contraindicated. Whereas in MRI, there is no such teratogenicity. The contrast used is iodinated contrast for CT and in MRI it is gadolinium and compounds of gadolinium. In acute head injury, because we have to image the patient fast, CT is preferred over MRI. Chronic pathologies, MRI is preferred over CT. The cost of MRI is very high, CT is comparatively less. So using patients with metallic stents, implants and pacemaker, CT yes, but MRI no. For renal failure, iodinated contrast allergy MRI can be used instead of CT. So these are some of the images you can see. This is the CT scan of the brain. So this is similarly an MRI scan. See MRI has T1 weighted image, T2 weighted image. The most important uh, things to identify is in a T2 weighted image the CSF will be white. That's all. So here you can see the ventricles here, the frontal horns of the well, lateral ventricles and uh, you can see the CSF which is inside the ventricles it is white and also the cerebrospinal fluid in between the sulci are white. So all these are white structures, CSF is white so this is a T2 weighted image. CT so you can see the brain which is just a grey and white image. So you can see a T1 weighted image when the CSF is dark in the ventricles. T2 weighted image the CSF is bright and what is flare? It's called as fluid attenuation. So the CSF is attenuated. It's called as fluid attenuated inversion recovery. So this is a principal MRI where the fluid is attenuated. So it's a T2 weighted image minus the CSF. That is a flare. So DWI. So DWI is diffusion weighted imaging which is very much used in acute stroke as I said earlier. People with hyperacute stroke can be diagnosed with hyper intense regions on diffusion weighted imaging. There will be restriction of diffusion in such regions. So DWI is diffusion weighted imaging. ADC is a corresponding DWI map. It is also called as apparent diffusion coefficient. So structures which are bright on diffusion weighted imaging, I mean, I mean to say lesions or pathologies will be darker on ADC. So that is how we give, uh, say whether the, uh, the lesion restricts diffusion or not. Okay. So if it is bright on DWI, it should be dark on the ADC. ADC is nothing but apparent diffusion coefficient. Then only there is a problem. If there is no diffusion restriction, the brightness on DWI will not be there. The, prob the pathology, suspected pathology will be dark on DWI. Hence, there is no restriction of diffusion in DWI for normal uh, causes. So this is CT of the spine. You can see the entire reformated CT, sagittal reformation of the spine. But as an MRI, we can directly do a sagittal image of the MRI. So we can see the MRI of the thoracolumbar spine. Again, there's an abdominal CT where you can see the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, the kidneys, the bowel, has corresponding MRI of the patient. And I was telling you about MRCP, see uh, how, the, how clearly the biliary tree is visualized. You can see the gallbladder, the cystic duct, the common hepatic duct, then the common bile duct, then the pancreatic duct and the confluence of the common uh, bile duct with the pancreatic duct, du duct into the ampulla veta and then the duodenum. This is a magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography used in biliary, hepatobiliary diseases. This is a musculoskeletal MRI where of the shoulder where is when you can see all the structures which are delineated very well. We can see the supraspinatus muscle and tendon, the greater tuberosity of the humerus, the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Just revising your anatomy knowledge. And this is the anterior circumflex artery. You have the suprascapular nerve and vessels, and this is the supraspinatus muscle.
the corresponding CT of the shoulder. Can we see the structures well? No. So for to see the structures, the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles, the MRI is best. CT nothing can be seen. But the bone is better seen on CT as you can see the humerus and the glenoid and this portion of the scapula are well seen on CT. So this is a volume rendering technique wherein after the CT has been done we do a volume rendering to see for any pathologies here you can see there is dislocation of the shoulder joint you can see the glenoid and the corresponding head of the humerus which is dislocated away from the glenoid cavity here you can see a fracture in the lower end of fibula as appreciated very well here and also in the tibia and also this is a reformated CT of the skull So this is an angiography. This is CT angiography. This is a volume rendered image. See how clearly you can see the vessels, their branches. So this is a aorta showing the ascending aorta, the aortic arch, the descending thoracic aorta, the abdominal aorta, and bifurcation of the aorta into the right and left common iliac arteries. So what you can see here in this image, all these white areas are atherosclerotic plaques so these are calcified plaques so you can see in the entire aorta even in the common iliac arteries so here also you can see there is the ct which shows the uh, aorta and the branches you can see that there is this calcif uh, calcifications as well and also we can see a aneurysm this is very well appreciated you can see the dilated portion of the aorta this is a aneurysm of the aorta so this is a CT brain wherein you can see large area white area which is almost uh, you can say biconvex in shape it is pushing the brain parenchyma and it is causing obscuration of the right half of the cerebral hemisphere this is nothing but a large extra dural hemorrhage which is a emergency so acute bleeds can be diagnosed well on ct thank you